Hi everybody, welcome. We'll just give it um, another minute or so while people are joining. Um, welcome to this webinar. It is uh, the sixth in our series on occupant-centric uh, simulation-aided building design. Um, so we've uh, got uh, one of the editors of the book, uh, Liam O'Brien here, who's going to take us past that halfway mark. Um, if you have missed some of the others, um, you can find recordings for all the previous sessions and indeed all of the, the webinars that we've done um, through the IBIPSA Education Committee on our YouTube channel. And I'll tell you more about that in just a minute. So this webinar is very much a core part of the purpose of the IBIPSA Education Committee. Um, our role is to identify education and training needs, and that's not just in academia, but also um, throughout the public sector, the private sector and in government, um, to initiate and coordinate new uh, materials and methods and to offer sessions like this. And a really important part of what we do is that sessions like this are open to non-members as well as to members. So um, without further ado, I'd like to invite Liam uh, to share his screen um, and to tell us more about occupant modelling uh, in building simulation. Thanks so much, Pamela. Um, can you confirm you can see my screen okay? Perfect, thank you. Um, so my name is Liam O'Brien and I'm the Editor, one of the co-editors of this book, um, and I'm also the lead author on this chapter, um, which is Introduction to Occupant Modeling. Um, so this is about halfway through the book. The first half, um, well, I, I can just talk about the book. The first half um, was quite fundamental and looked at what are the needs of occupants and how do we um, gather information about occupants either through surveys, interviews, um, measurements, using existing data, et cetera. Um, we also looked at occupant-centric performance metrics. This chapter and the, the second half of the book, um, we're, we're right here, um, is moving into occupant modeling. So sort of quantitatively characterizing occupants for the whole purpose of bringing it into building performance simulation to improve the accuracy of um, models and, and predicting overall performance, but also predicting occupants better. Of course, occupants are not easy to predict, um, but I'll get into that in a moment. So a little bit of background. What are our objectives? Um, well, I'd say we'd like to characterize occupants um, for the following reasons. We'd like to obtain more accurate performance predictions. There's a lot of, I would say, obsession over the so-called performance gap, the gap between measured and predicted performance, predicted through building simulation usually. Um, and occupants are often blamed for this or more neutrally, um, they're considered to be one of the, the components of that gap. Um, and so arguably one of the reasons we want to uh, model occupants better is to, to close the gap. There are other reasons like weather and, and uh, construction quality, et cetera. Um, but I think much more importantly, we want to have a model that's good enough for its purpose, so fit for purpose in helping us to make big decisions. Um, so I, I'll refer to this photo on the right. Um, if we had assumed all the shades were open all of the time, that might have influenced our lighting decisions and our lighting control decisions. It might have even influenced our cooling and heating equipment supplies, et cetera. Um, but one of our objectives of, of uh, improving occupant modeling is to predict how people behave in buildings. And so um, we might get something a little bit more realistic, like what we see here on the facade, some shades are open, some shades are closed. Um, that's gonna have all sorts of impacts on building performance. And we'd really like to design according to how people actually behave and not um, according to, to some simplistic assumptions. Um, the last thing, and this is a little bit higher level. I think it's important to elevate the discussion about occupants. 
if they're on the design table, we kind of treat occupants as another building system or as a boundary condition. Um, we forget that occupants are human and um, to some extent, their behavior is controllable by us, the designers. Um, so we can influence, not necessarily control, but we can influence occupant behavior. Um, and I think if we treat occupants as just a boundary condition, we forget about that power um, and we design accordingly. And I'll note a shout out to the next chapter, uh, which is called the Fit for Purpose Occupant Modeling or something like that. I don't remember the exact title. Um, it's all about, okay, now that we've talked about the models, how do we choose the right models? Um, and to give a little bit of a, a preview of what that's about, the, the right model really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, so certainly I'm not gonna tell you that one type of model is the best today. What I'll tell you is that the best model depends on what you're trying to achieve, um, balancing accuracy, simplicity, um, level of detail and predicting certain aspects of behavior, et cetera. So it's not trivial. Before we get into occupant modeling methods, I thought it would be good to talk about some definitions. I think these definitions are more or less well understood by the, the occupant modeling community, but not necessarily by the building performance simulation community, community at large. So I'm going to go left to right, although this is a little bit of a loop. So I guess I'll, I'll say I'll go clockwise. Um, so occupant behavior um, is usually triggered by something, and it might be an adaptive trigger, what we call an adaptive trigger, something like discomfort. Often when there's discomfort, one of the things we try to do is improve comfort. And, and there's many ways to do this. Some of them are physiological, like sweating, um, but other methods involve adapting the building, things like um, turning on lights and closing blinds and adjusting thermostats, opening windows, et cetera. Um, so we have adaptive triggers that, that sort of speak to our comfort or our discomfort. Then there's non-adaptive triggers um, like habits, schedules, um, perhaps something like you're know, baking a loaf of bread. That's that's not we don't do that necessarily because we're uncomfortable, but rather you know it's part of our our daily routine. Um, these triggers are sort of filtered by some contextual factors. For example, um, if we're in a room and we find it's a little bit dark, but there's other people in the room, we might be hesitant to. Uh, turn on the light because we know we're going to affect other people. So we need to consider those contextual factors. Um, and then there's occupancy. And in my community, occupancy could refer to several things. Uh, it's presence of people, but it could be a binary state. So a building could be occupied or unoccupied. It could be the number of occupants. It could be the density of occupants. So how many people per square meter or how many square meter square meters per person. Um, it could refer to the demographics as well, like number of children, number of adults, number of uh, men, number of women, et cetera. Um, and usually occupancy is considered a prerequisite for actions. So in other words, for someone to open a window or, or turn on a light, usually you need occupants present. Not always if these things can be remotely adjusted. Um, and then the action, I think, is pretty straightforward. That's uh, sort of the, the physical action, if you will, the input um, to the building system. But the result of that is a state. So if we turn the light on and that's the action, um, the state that results from that is the light is on. And I realize this is kind of basic, um, but I guess you could say that the point is that when we develop occupant behavior models, we're either trying to predict actions or we're trying to predict the resulting state. And I'll get into this later, but most of our existing models focus on predicting states and they do that using schedules. Uh, very few models in practice try to predict the actions. I should say um, as a little bit of pretext, no one, no researcher believes we can 100% predict 
actions, you know, the timing and the exact action that's taken. What we're trying to do is get a little bit closer to being able, able to predict these things. Um, even if we could predict it perfectly for one person, so one person is robotic and highly predictable, um, and there are some people that are like that probably, we don't know who's going to be in a building in most cases when we're doing design or retrofit um, or doing operations, et cetera. So we need to recognize there is some inherent, inherent uncertainty just from the fact that we don't know who will occupy a building. And then there's a bit of a closed loop because this action and the resulting state could affect especially the indoor environmental quality. Um, and that's the beauty of building performance simulation is you can have these closed loops where our action impacts um, the indoor environmental quality, the indoor environmental quality affects our action and so on. And then, you know, these things propagate over the course of the simulation period. So hopefully I didn't lose you. So I want to bring this back down to the ground a little bit. Here's some examples, some photos of um, things that might trigger someone to close a blind, um, leave their office entirely, et cetera. This is my office, and those are my two main adaptive measures. I can close the blind, which you can see is not all that effective, or I just go home. Uh, so current practice in modeling this is the first thing we're going to talk about, and then we'll move on to more advanced approaches. In essence, the majority of the current practice is um, treating occupants the same way we treat weather and climate. It's just a boundary condition. And the implicit assumption here is that building designers cannot affect those boundary conditions. They cannot affect occupants. So what this diagram is trying to show is that occupants are an input. Um, so we have some operating conditions, we have our, our, our building model or our building, and then the output is the performance, whether it's energy, comfort, emissions, and so on. But this is a one-way arrow from occupants, implying that occupants produce heat, they produce moisture, you know, they produce odor, CO2, etc. Um, but there's no recognition in this conventional way of thinking that the building affects the occupants. Um, and I think this is very limiting. It sort of it takes the power or the control away from the designer. And it, um, in essence, says, well, we, we, we can't be blamed for, you know, the way people are behaving. Mm -hmm. And if there's one thing you take away from today, I hope it's that actually building designers do have some control over behavior. Um, and we need to take advantage of this to try to um, at least nudge occupants towards behaving a little bit more expectedly. How do we do that? Well, we provide an inherently more comfortable, more usable building that does not trigger people to do things that are energy intensive and extreme, like opening windows in the middle of winter because they can't control the temperature in their space or they don't understand how to use the thermostat or the set point is fixed and it's controlled centrally and that set point is really inappropriate for um, the types of occupants that are in a space, like chefs in a kitchen. Um, and I note that Ashray um, sort of reinforces this notion. Um, and I, I really like this diagram because it shows all of the different heat flows in a building. Um, and in the one sense, it's excellent for explaining very vividly how everything interacts, interacts and all our design decisions interact and we can't be designing our envelope and our HVAC separately. Um, on the other hand, it reinforces, as I said, the, the notion that occupants are an input into the building. So here it's saying they're latent and sensible um, heat gains and that's the extent of the role of occupants. If I were to redraw this, what I would like is that those arrows are two-way um, and that the occupants attach to practically all these different things. The occupant affects the fenestration, um, they affect you know, the, the equipment, the lighting, maybe the, the solar heat gains because they can control curtains and blinds um, and so on. And so, if I were to redraw that previous diagram I showed with the one-way arrow, what we'd like to uh, reinforce is the notion that 
Um, the building is going to affect all the domains of IEQ, so acoustic comfort, visual comfort, thermal comfort, indoor air quality. That's going to affect the occupant in rather complex ways. Um, you know, there's still some discussion on how these forms of IEQ interact with each other. So, for example, if things are really bright, we might want cooler conditions. Um, so, in reality, this is very complex. And the occupant experiences all these things simultaneously, and then they act upon the building. Um, and they might do things like, um, you know, very temporary acts, turn on a fan or something. They might also do something really permanent, like um, jam something open or MacGyver something so that uh, a diffuser is permanently blocked. Um, they might break things, etc. cetera. It's, it's quite unpredictable on the one hand. On the other hand, we can't blame the occupant for trying to be comfortable and trying to you know, devote their time to what they want to do in the building and not maintaining comfort. So as I said, the traditional way of representing occupants is through schedules. Um, and this is largely reinforced by building codes. Um, and on the one hand, I, I don't blame building codes for taking this approach. On the other hand, I think it's really taken away um, a lot of the freedom that designers have to think about how occupants will behave in buildings. So the benefit of these schedules, um, like the ones I'm showing here, is that they're simple, intuitive, um, and they're enforceable. And that last point's really important because it could be subject to abuse. Because occupants are uncertain, designers could make very optimistic assumptions about how people behave. And, and so we, as a designer, might you know, be very aspirational and, and hope that, that occupants are sort of perfect, when in reality, that's not likely to be the case. Um, if you're unfamiliar with these sorts of schedules, I'll, I'll just very briefly explain. Um, the values here for occupancy and lighting go to, from zero to one, and this is the time of day across the bottom. This is probably for an office on a weekday, I believe. And these numbers between zero and one get multiplied by some standardized uh, densities and um, you know, whether it's lighting and it's watts per square meter per square foot, or for occupancy, it's usually expressed as square feet or square meters per person. Um, and then that's applied to the building. And it gets multiplied by the heat gains and the emissions of, of CO2, et cetera. The limitations of this, I mean, aside from the accuracy, I won't even talk about the accuracy for now, um, but it neglects the impact that building design has on behavior. So it's, again, treating it as a boundary condition. And it neglects uncertainty. And uncertainty, I'm going to argue, is very important. Um, and not because you know uncertainty leads to problems, but also that we can um, we can really profit off this uncertainty, and I'll, I'll explain this with an example in a moment. Um, so the risk of looking at schedules and fixed schedules is that we um, we often assume worst case scenarios, especially for size and heating. Um, in reality, it's very unlikely that we're going to have the perfect storm of, um, you know, maximum occupancy, lighting, equipment, et cetera. Um, so the, the chance of undersizing, well, well, if we ex if we assume very extreme conditions, we'll, we'll tend to oversize. Um, but if we start to try to quantify uncertainty a little bit more, we can become more comfortable with the fact that we can... Um, knock off some of our, our chiller size or our, our boiler size or, or whatnot, um, because the risk of exceeding, exceeding a certain size um, or, or a certain load is relatively small. So this is straight from our book, and so there's a lot of text here, but I just wanted to go through what are some of the common areas of modeling and how are these commonly done? And I won't go through them all, just a couple of highlights. Um, so on the left here, we start with occupancy or presence. This is usually defined as a schedule and a corresponding occupant density. 
Um, but then there's some things we completely neglect for the most part. And I'm, I'm looking mainly from the North American context and building codes. Um, but operable windows, we usually assume they're closed. And again, the building codes are trying to reinforce this notion that we can't count on occupants to behave well, therefore have you know very simplistic assumptions. Um, and I, I think this is a problem because there are ways to um, promote better behavior, not just through education, but through better design. Um, and then of course, there's things like clothing level where um, there was sort of an implicit assumption that people wear 0.5 clothes, which is like pants and a shirt in the summer, and one clue in the winter, which is like a suit. Um, and there's assumptions for other domains as well, to varying degrees of complexity, but in general, very simple. In what I'll call uh, more advanced occupant modeling, there's a few features we try to bring in that have some benefits. So I'll talk about those next. The first one is stochasticity or, or randomness. Um, the next one is dynamicism or having kind of a two-way interaction between the people in the buildings, recognizing that conditions affect behavior. And the last is to have data-driven models. So these are evidence-based rather than assumptions or, or feelings or experience. Um, we're talking use data, ideally a lot of data to um, build better models. So I first want to talk about stochastic versus deterministic. So deterministic models, um, when you run a simulation that results in a single prediction, like 100 kilowatt hours per square meter per year. Stochastic models have a, um, a distribution for the predicted performance. Um, so instead of having 100% certainty, on your prediction, of course, not in reality, on, on uh, performance, we uh, predict a certain distribution. Um, and so this is quite powerful. We can do a few things, so we might wanna do a few things. One is to reduce the uncertainty um, because uncertainty is generally expensive because we were you know, risk adverse. Um, but we can also try to move the mean down or up depending on the direction we want to do. Um, so a lot of practitioners, I would say, are, are quite uncomfortable with this approach. Why? Lots of reasons. For one thing, you don't want to be telling your client, well, they're, you know, we might perform this way, we might perform that way. It's sort of admitting uncertainty, um, which shouldn't be a problem because everyone who has any experience with buildings knows there's uncertainty. But at the same time, it's um, you know a little bit difficult to present that to a client, and it um, they might confuse, you know, uncertainty with lack of confidence, which it kind of is. Um, the next trait I want to talk about is data-driven, data-drivenness, if that's a word. Um, and so here's an example of a large office building in, in my home city of Ottawa. And we looked at the plug loads for 24 hours across lots of floors and um, lots of tenants and, and I think a couple of buildings and day types, et cetera. And we plotted all of those. So this is again, um, 24 hours and then the corresponding plug loads. This is watts per square meter. And um, in doing this, we could figure out what a reasonable schedule was. If we had one schedule, what would that average schedule look like? Um, and it's this solid black line here. Um, and so this is what I'd call a data-driven model. Some of the schedules we're using, um, I, I won't you know name names, but some of the schedules that, that we use very commonly in North America are quite dated now. And a lot of things are evolving, especially related to occupants and the equipment they use, like, like computers and printers and coffee makers, et cetera. Um, and so one of the things I'm advocating here is using more um, recent data because this has all sorts of impacts. It's not just the energy um, we're using for a plug in equipment, but also all of the heat corresponding heating and cooling loads. Um, 
So the, the goal of deterministic models, the schedules, um, is to predict an occupant action or a state, and then they usually have um, inputs. The most common input is time of day, but in theory, it could also be indoor environmental um, conditions, etc. The majority of deterministic models are schedules, but that doesn't mean they all are. And I wanted to um, do a shout out to one example of a commonly used deterministic model that's actually rule-based. Um, and it is from the IES LM83. This is commonly used to predict lighting and um, shade-related energy for lead. And they actually recognize that design impacts behavior because um, you have to look at the luminance indoors and then that predicts certain behaviors related to lighting and shading. Um, but that's a fairly rare example of a rule-based model. Most of our models for occupants are just schedules. So stochastic models are a little bit more complex, admittedly, and I, I, I understand probably the audience here is a mix between researchers and practitioners. And I'm not saying this is the best tool for every practitioner, but this is just a, a background uh, presentation. So this, the objective of the stochastic models is to predict the probability of an occupant action. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll go to the example on the right before moving on. So this comes out of our book chapter, and it's an example. Um, it is data-driven. What they looked at is how likely was it for someone to open a window um, depending on, well, it was morning, um, but depending on the room temperature and the carbon dioxide concentration. And I, I believe it's how likely are they to open it in the next 15 minutes, which is a key detail. Um, so this suggests that if the carbon dioxide is very high, like 4,000 parts per million, and it's 30 degrees, there's a um, something like 1.3% chance that they open the window in the next 15 minutes. And then unsurprisingly, if the air is better and it's colder, they're much less likely to open the window. So what we can do is implement this into a building performance simulation tool uh, and run it for a whole year, and we can predict the likelihood that they open or close the window. Um, but we don't just predict the likelihood, we actually implement that. So um, for every time step, we kind of roll the virtual dice. And well, there's only a 1.3% chance that they open the window here. But at each time step, if we evaluate that, they're likely to open it at some point during the day. Um, and then because this is building performance simulation and everything kind of affects everything else, we should link this to an airflow network or some sort of model that predicts more airflow into the room from outside. And this is going to impact the temperature, which will probably drop the temperature, which is going to reduce the probability that they um, open the window or other windows, and it probably increases the chance that they close some windows, etc. So it's really a dynamic process. Um, and here's another example of a um, stochastic model. This is something we built at Carleton, where I work, and we tried to predict the likelihood that someone turns on an office when they walk into their office. Um, so if it's very dark, zero lux, at night, not many people are walking in, but if they do, there was like a roughly 40% chance that they turn on a light. But if it's 100 lux, the chance is now only something like uh, 7%. So the most common way to do stochastic modeling in our domain at, at the moment is using Markov chain models. And Markov chain models are predicting transitions. Um, so they, they're they called memory, memoryless um, in that they don't look far back. They just consider what are, what's the current state, for example, of a, a window. Is it open? Is it closed? And then what are some of the environmental variables, one or more environmental variables? So it could include um, air quality, temperature, uh, humidity, 
noise, if we're worried about noise being transmitted through the window, et cetera. It could include many different things. The point is it's predicting how likely is it that in the next um, X minutes, someone takes an action and changes the state. We can also have three state or, or end state stochastic models that predict transition between more than two states. So for example, if a room has two off two windows, um, we can predict the likelihood of going from you know both windows closed to both windows open or both windows closed to one window open, et cetera. And this can be a function of multiple inputs. I wanted to give a little bit of a concrete example of where these stochastic models might be useful. Um, so I know this is the inside of the NREL RSF building, um, which has really been a lot of inspiration for me because I think a lot of the principles I'm talking about have been incorporated. They made the building more inherently comfortable by having these fixed louvers that are kind of visible there. Um, and these greatly reduced glare. Essentially, they designed it so that no direct sunlight can go from outside from the sun and hit people in the face or on their desk. Um, and the result is that people are more inherently comfortable and so they don't have to do extreme things. Um, but that's just an aside, but kind of the inspiration for my example. So I, I wanted to come up with a, a small example that illustrates some of the power of stochastic models and also this dynamic feature of models. So, my model assumes shades get closed if um, the, the direct normal radiation exceeds 50 watts per square meter and penetrates um, a meter or more deeply into the space. Um, so they close the shades if that happens, but then they will open them X days later, where X is some number um, with a mean of three days and a standard deviation of three days. And this is to incorporate the uncertainty of occupants. We know that this is what happens. People get triggered to close shades when there's glare, um, but they often don't reopen them for a long period, sometimes never. Um, so this is what I was trying to simulate here. And then the lights are controlled to achieve 500 lux or greater in the work plane. In other words, if the daylight is above this, lights go off. If the daylight is below 500, lights turn on. So I looked at two cases, one with a sort of fixed shading or an overhang, and the other with no um, solar protection. And then I ran 100 simulations um, for each of these designs, one with the overhang and one without. And the result is, of course, a distribution because there's uncertainty um, or, or stochasticity with regard to how soon after they open the shade. So what we're seeing in general is with the overhang, um, the occupants are less likely triggered to, to close the blind. And so the blind stays open more, which means that the light can stay off for longer. And I didn't look here at heating and cooling, which would be another story. Um, but the value of the distributions is we can start to understand the range of possible outcomes and we can play with the tightness of that distribution. Um, so if we really value certainty, we might favor certain designs over others. And arguably the most certain design of all would be to have no windows um, because then there's no uh, visual stimuli to, to trigger these things. But of course, I'm not advocating for that. Um, and we can also look at the extremes. The shades are always open, shades are always closed, and then understand um, different designs within um, that range of outcomes. And just to help understand what was happening there, with no overhang, no fixed shading, the shade was open um, only briefly in the summer because the sun is so high in the sky that, that there isn't clear. But with a fixed shade, shade in case, um, the shades can stay open for much of the you know, spring, summer, fall. Um, and so the lights stay off for much longer. So just a couple other concepts um, before I wrap up. Um, one of the things we talk about in the chapter is agent-based models. 
And these borrow from a lot of the same concepts I talked about before, but it's maybe a different way of thinking about things. So agent-based modeling is all about developing different agents, if you will, and they're not necessarily humans. They could be occupants, they could be vehicles, they could be building systems like lighting systems, HVAC, um, robots, I guess they could be furniture technically, really anything. Um, and agent-based modeling is all about writing or describing the rules of interaction between these agents and then running a simulation accordingly. So we talk a little bit about that in the book, um, but there's also been some recent uh, papers from our authors on this topic. The last way of modeling I'm going to talk about is through personas. And as building designers, engineers, modelers, etc., this is kind of a, a weird concept, I would say, or at least unusual. But I think it's really interesting. It's borrowed from um, product design. For example, phones or cars or whatever. And instead of trying to come up with the average occupant, um, what personas tries to do is come up with um, kind of prototype people that aren't necessarily statistically representative of the building. So it might not be the average or, or we're not necessarily trying to cluster our people. It's just coming up with some characters that help us think about who we're designing for. Um, so this is one example from the book. This is a, a persona um, made up by one of um, the author's grandmothers. Um, but but it talks about how she has certain habits, like she visits her grandkids, she watches TV, she enjoys, enjoys doing crossword puzzles, um, she sets her thermostat between 72 and 75 Fahrenheit, um, she uses a certain amount of energy and so on. Um, and by coming up with these, we can think a little bit better about who we're designing for, because when we're talking about numbers and schedules and densities, it really dehumanizes the design process. And what we'd like to do is humanize it and think about who's going to live there, who's going to work there, what are their needs, how are they going to behave, what are their uh, capabilities regarding accessibility, and so on. Um, and one of my graduate students just came up with a, a study where she had eight personas. Um, and just to briefly explain, some are morning people, some are evening people, some really value um, thermal comfort, and some have a preference for, for visual comfort over everything else. Some are more energy efficient, some just value uh, broad comfort overall without being really picky on any domain of IEQ, etc. Um, and as, as sort of simplistic as this is, it would be a major um, development in moving away from this idea that we have the average occupant um, to actually recognizing that people are going to be occupying our buildings. How do we implement these occupant models into building performance simulation? Well, traditionally, the most common way of modeling occupants was schedules. Um, so unsurprisingly, most of our tools are set up to model those quite well. Um, so I've got a screenshot on the right of Energy Plus and the IDF editor. This is how we specify schedules. And this is, I think, undisp undisputably the simplest way to implement occupant models, if you will. Um, but there's some more complex ways to do it that, that bring in more accuracy, of course, at the cost of complexity and, and effort. Um, so the next most simple might be rules. So things like, you know, lights turn on above um, or, or sorry, below 500 lux or 300 lux. And we might not see this as an occupant doing that, but it, it could be an occupant that does it. So even if we don't have automated controls, we could use sort of uh, simulation features that are intended for automation to implement these sorts of behaviors that are very rule-based. Um, but the next simplest would be to use something like EMS if you're using Energy Plus. Um, so all of the models I talked about today, even the complex ones, can be modeled using EMS. This is something 
um, a couple of my PhD students have done for their thesis. So is it trivial? Probably not, but it's um, not terribly complex either. Um, the next most complex is co-simulation, where we have two tools talking to each other. Um, so perhaps we have a tool that does the occupant modeling, and then we have our, our core BPS tool. This is very different than schedules because there's, they're dynamically linked. And this is really important because it recognizes, as I said before, we want the building to affect the occupant and the occupant to affect the building. This happens in reality. Schedules do not capture this two-way interaction. And the most complex would be to implement new models using source code, which I'm sure is within the capability of some people watching. Um, the last thing we looked at in this chapter is visualizing model outputs. Um, we're so used to assuming fixed schedules that the outputs of our models are not all that interesting. Um, but as soon as we bring in more complex models that uh, you know are stochastic or um, have otherwise variable schedules, it can be really interesting to see how are people actually behaving. Some of these models can predict how many times people act, and so perhaps our our goal is not just to reduce energy use, but also the number of times per year that someone needs to um, intervene in the system. So it's really important to, to visualize these results accurately. So what are the takeaways of what I just talked about? Um, so I think occupant modeling is treated in simplistic ways that are often unfit for purpose. Um, at the same time, I'm certainly not advocating for the most advanced methods to model occupants. And frankly, there's been developments since we've written the chapter. Um, I'd be the last person to say that we should use models that are state of the art, um, especially in practice. I think you know the more complex, the more room there is for error, they're hard to interpret. Um, they might be very specialized and, and kind of overfit for one building, but not very generalizable. Um, so I'm certainly not advocating for that. There's a room for that in research, uh, but probably not so much in practice. Um, the third thing, uncertainty is not a bad word. And I even question whether the performance gap, gap should be considered bad, because the performance gap can also um, show that real performance is better than predictions. Um, the, Benefit of detailed occupant modeling is that it can help elevate this discussion about occupants, which I think is lacking in general in the first place. So however you model your occupants, it's really important to actually talk about the occupants and, and share common language among different designers, the architects, the different engineers, the landscape engineer, the clients, uh, sorry, landscape architect, the client, et cetera. Right now, there's very little dialogue about occupants from all my experience around the design table. Um, this area is ripe with opportunities. Um, there's a reason why it's kind of exploded. I mean, one of the reasons is occupants play a greater and greater role in building performance and occupants are arguably more important than ever as we recognize the consequences of, of bad comfort and, and indoor air quality. Um, but there's also lots of op opportunities, things like AI for modeling, um, big data, where we have millions of people's worth of information, like you know smart thermostat data, or occupancy using cameras or Google Map data, et cetera. Um, there's so many opportunities. But we need systemic joint efforts to start to standardize these things. Um, and I would argue the best way to move the needle is through building codes and standards. I've written many papers criticizing the way occupants are treated in building codes and standards. Um, so you can look those up. But, but in brief, I think we need to move things forward quite a bit uh, in the next decade. And with that, I, I thank you for your time and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Liam. That was uh, absolutely fascinating. Um, so if you have any questions for Liam, please use the Q&A box, which I think you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. Um, pop your questions in there um, and I will put them to Liam. I have uh, actually 
loads of questions of my own because that was really uh, fascinating but I shall try and restrict myself to just uh, one or two. Um, I was wondering Liam if you could talk about um, how how this relates to to the design stages um, and also perhaps even the life cycle of a building because one of the the real challenges is obviously that the point at which you have most control is the point at which you don't actually know who these occupants are and in many situations you may be designing buildings um, speculatively um, nobody knows who these occupants are later on when you do know who the occupants are you've got a lot less control um, you, you're stuck with a lot more fixed um, parameters so how, how does that influence occupant modeling how can you accommodate that in the way you model a good question um so what i would say there's uncertainty like through the whole life cycle even when the building is built and the occupants are known people don't last forever usually buildings outlast people um especially in europe not so much in north america um that was an unnecessary tangent but <laughs> um my the, the one thing i'd advocate for is look at a few different scenarios and this is one of my criticisms for building codes is that you're not forced to do that and so we have to assume um something about the occupants but the consequence of that is that our buildings are not very adaptive um, and so technologies or strategies like demand control ventilation and occupancy based lighting are not encouraged enough enough i think because we just assume in offices you know 90 percent occupancy during the day um same thing with hvac zoning you know our it's very uh course resolution of HVAC zoning because we when you apply a certain schedule that assumes perfectly distributed occupants through the building um you neglect the fact that that's not reality especially in this day and age um so I, I think the, the very simplest thing you can do for occupant modeling beyond the basic schedules is just assume two or three schedules like you know one thing I do is multiply those schedules by 0.5 and 1.5 and then you get a range um the only other comment i'll i'll make is that um in existing buildings where we have lots of information about occupants potentially then perhaps it makes sense to calibrate a model if we're doing retrofits or advanced you know building upgrades maybe we can calibrate the model based on more accurate occupant assumptions um whereas in new builds we have no idea who's gonna be there for the most part yeah that's really interesting um have you seen anybody using the personas approach as part of that conversation with occupants um i can imagine that trying to have a conversation with occupants where you you show them a schedule and <laughs> say does this respect reflect what you do uh might not be terribly helpful but perhaps the persona um might be something much more familiar that you could get feedback on i, I completely agree again it's about humanizing it and clients won't understand schedules or certainly not stochastic models I think the persona approach is much more tangible for um, non-experts. And in terms of is this used in practice, I don't think so very much based on all of my experience. It is in other fields, certainly. Um, it, it's almost like marketing speak, like thinking about who's going to use the, you know, the iPhone or whatever. Um, but if people are interested in this topic, my PhD student, Arefe, uh, just graduated uh, or defended her, her thesis successfully and it's largely about personas um, so you can read about that there thank you that would be very interesting um, a project that I've been involved in uh, in Lima in informal settlements we, we've used personas primarily because it was a way of being able to uh, communicate with occupants and actually understand uh, better what their behaviours were rather, and, and what it showed was that there were lots of assumptions that we were making uh, based on, for example, survey data which said somebody owned a washing machine, but they actually used that device in a very different way to, to the way that we expected. In fact, they, they actually used it for the spin cycle only. Uh, it was too expensive to heat 
the water um, and the personas were a way of having that conversation which was really helpful um, I shall let other people get a word in now though um, and move on to some questions from the audience um, so the first question um, asks about how we can use subjective parameters in occupant modeling such as environmental concern and cold tolerance so do you see a way that those can be brought in? Can we understand those parameters better? Is that part perhaps of this uh, uh, persona approach as well? I think so, certainly. So we can either try to quantify those subjective parameters, like map, somehow map those onto um, quantitative models, um, or we could use personas. Um, but I, I don't really consider those subjective parameters. Uh, oh, sorry, environmental concern. Yeah, so we could, in fact, that's something Arefe did in her PhD. She had some people that were very sensitive to environmental uh, concerns. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the best way would be to map it onto um, quantitative measures, like the plug load is divided in half or you know, appliance use is halved or whatever, something like that. Yeah, that sounds like mm -hmm. a very practical approach. Thank you for that. Um, so the next question is from Nilufar Zari, um, asking if there's a way to reduce the energy performance gap based on occupant behavior for building standards and certificates such as these. And this is going back to the um, to a point that you were making that because obviously there are a lot of occupant patterns and behaviors are very different and, and it's different in different countries but these certificates um, assume that there is a standard set pattern for everybody at the design stage yeah i really like this question um, and we we have a paper where we compared 23 different building codes around the world to understand what they're assuming about occupants and actually how they even describe occupants, which is also, you know, a huge range. Um, and there were big differences. And the question is, are those cultural differences or energy cost differences? Um, but to answer the question directly, I, I think it makes sense to have different schedules if we're going to use the schedule approach different schedules in different countries um, because habits are so different and like north americans use i don't know 10 times more energy than their counterparts in some countries so it makes no sense to borrow our schedules thank you um if you have time maybe you could pop uh a link in the chat for, for some of that um, literature yes I'm very interested to see that um, so the next question is from Noelia um, Vincente Gomez, um, asking about the implementation of occupancy-centric control in HVAC systems for retrofit for, for retrofitting purposes. And in those cases, do you think the type of occupant model that is uh, fit for the purpose? Is there a specific Absolutely. occupant model that you would suggest or approach? Um, so I'm just reading the question, but I, I think the same sorts of models would be um, perfect. We have, um, as part of the Annex 79, which this book came out of, we had a whole subtask, like a whole working group on the topic of occupant-centric controls. Um, so I'd encourage uh, I'd encourage them to to go back and read some of the papers that came out of that. Um, and if I have it. A moment I'll try to pop a key paper into the chat. Thank you. It's really helpful to have those links for, for people um, to follow up. Um, so now there is a question, perhaps from somebody you know, um, from Arefa Fati, um, asking, do you think codes should be more specific regarding occupants or should they just give more authority um, to designers? Well, that's a good question. That would have been a good uh thesis defense question. Uh, <laughs> well, I I think you cannot rely too much on people to act in good faith when it comes to building codes. 
maybe that's a controversial comment. Um, but but at the end of the day, there's pressures to uh, find loopholes and, and exaggerate performance and things like that. So I'm afraid my answer would be that uh, we need to be more specific. I think we need to change the way building codes work, but not necessarily by providing more latitude to code users. Thank you. I'm afraid a slightly cynical response there, but uh, as ever with these things, the um, the issue is as much in enforcement um, as it is in the, the code itself um, and being able to enforce something um, is is much more straightforward when you when you have a specific standard, um, I guess. So um, thank you, Liam, um, for a really fascinating insight. Um, thank you to the audience for some great questions, which have given a lot of food for thought. Um, I'll put the links that Liam's posted here on YouTube when um, when the recording is placed on YouTube as well, so you can follow up there. Um, if you would like to to know more about the um, about the topic, then you're in the right place. We have another four webinars in this series coming up. Um, you can see some QR codes there for the sign up links. Uh, it's a busy month in May next week. We're back with fit for purpose occupant modeling. Um, and then at the end of the month, we'll be looking at advanced simulation methods uh, for occupant centric building design. And then in June, we, we finish up with this series. Um, but this is not the only webinar series that we're running at the moment. We also um, are running an occasional series which follows on from what we did last year on urban building energy modelling. Um, now we're looking at implementation of urban building energy modelling and looking at specific tools uh, and how they can be applied. And the next one of those is also in May coming up on the 24th. And we have Jerome Kampf um, from the IDAP um, Institute. And we also have uh, a very, um, a very much a practice focused presentation with Das Aradin uh, Murray uh, from WSP, who will be joining to, to give a very hands on uh, view of using tools in practice. And so if you aren't able to join us for any of those, um, but you do want to uh, find out more, then do look out for our YouTube channel, which is at IBIPSA University. Um, we've now got about 60 videos on there, um, lots of content. There's a whole, um, in effect, a whole education in building simulation, just about anything that you could want to know more about in relation to building simulation. We've probably held a webinar on that topic um, and you can, uh, you can find it there. So do subscribe uh, to be notified when we add new content. And if you look at that channel and you think there isn't something, there is, we've missed a topic that you really wanted to know more about, then do please get in touch, either comment on YouTube um, or you can comment directly um, to me on LinkedIn, on the um, IBIPSA uh, group. And the other way to get involved is, of course, to join IBIPSA as a supporting member. And our supporting members support the work of IBIPSA um, and make a huge contribution to what we're able to do. Uh, you have a choice of a print subscription or online subscription to the Journal of Building Performance Simulation and you, our supporting members have the right to use um, the IBIPSA supporting member logo. The fees have remained unchanged since 2019, um, so they're really remarkably good value um, with a range of options there and you can find out more about that at ibipsa.org slash membership. Um, so that's, I think, all that we've got time for today. Thank you very much for joining us and I hope to see you again uh, next week. And thank you very much to Liam for such an excellent presentation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Pamela.